today we are going to begin our fourth module, where we would be talking about uh, once again the factors related to human adjustment processes. Today uh, we are going to begin with something what is called as maintenance needs. Okay. Uh, those of you who have been to the introductory psychology course, uh, they must have gone through the need hierarchy theory of Abraham Maslow. Do you remember that theory? How many of you had undergone uh, PSY 151? None. Okay. Uh, the Maslow's need hierarchy theory uh, basically talks about uh, certain types of uh, human needs which are put in the hierarchical order. Okay. The hierarchy is such that you have it is something like a pyramid structure, okay, where at the base you have the physiological needs or they are called the biogenic needs, hunger, thirst, sex and sleep. These four are considered to be biogenic needs, because they are uh, biologically wired uh, within us as human beings. The rest of the needs are called as uh, psychosociogenic needs, means these are basically psychological needs which also has social origin, okay. where I think of need for affiliation, where I have that uh, I tend to satisfy my need for belongingness, need for security. Okay. You want uh, certain things in your life to be very, very stable. Okay. You do not want to begin life every day from the scratch, that is the need for security, need for affiliation. Okay. Uh, that I should belong to somebody, I should be able to say that these are my family members, these are my friends, these are the people whom I can trust or others who can say that I am a trustworthy man, others who can say that he is a part of my family, others who can say that uh, no, he is a good friend of mine. This satisfies our need for affiliation. Once you achieve this state, then you move to a, a state what is called as uh, no, uh, need for self esteem where you realize that uh, you know, several components in your life have been under your control and hence your overall self esteem increases. Everybody would like to attain that state and the final stage what is called as the need for self actualization. Self actualization is a state where you have your own philosophy of life, you advocate it and there are many who will follow you. Now, Maslow's need hierarchy theory basically it is in the pyramid shape. So, at the base you have the biogenic needs, on the top you have the need for self actualization. Now, what Abraham Maslow says is that uh, now when you start satisfying your human needs, you begin with basically satisfying your biogenic needs first and then you start moving upwards. Okay. Now, when you move upwards, okay, it is not that say uh, a particular need has to be completely satisfied to uh, attain stage 2. For example, hunger, thirst, okay. now these are the needs that are recurrent in nature. So, I had my food, but again after a couple of hours I will feel hungry. So, that need to satisfy hunger will once again crop in. But I am very much comfortable now, because I know that once I feel hungry, I have an option of visiting a place where I can find food of my choice. Hence, my biogenic needs are satisfied and I know that uh, needs that are recurrent in nature will also be catered to. Hence, I very comfortably move to level 2. Once it is you know partially satisfied, okay, and I feel comfortable with it, I go ahead you know satisfying my need for security and this is how you know people keep moving. One interpretation of this pyramid shape is uh, that you have to move and your larger part of your effort, your time goes into satisfying the needs which uh, you know acquires the largest space in the need hierarchy theory of uh, Abraham Maslow. Means more and more of your time uh, and energy would initially go into satisfying the biogenic needs. The other interpretation of it is that a larger number of population still remains satisfying the needs 
uh, which acquires a larger space in the knee hierarchy theory. This would mean that uh, no, you will have large number of people still struggling to satisfy their biogenic needs, need for affiliation, need for security, whereas very few who would reach the level of uh, self actualization, where one would be professing certain ways of life and there would be thousands and millions of people following him or her. Okay. So, this is all about the need hierarchy theory. From a adjustment point of view, the importance of uh, this very uh, need hierarchy model is that you have to gradually move towards satisfying the upper needs. Means, you begin with satisfying the biogenic needs okay, and then you gradually move to a stage where uh, you are not at all concerned about uh, you know, satisfying certain needs of your life and you uh, know are celebrated like a, a hero in a particular discipline whom people obey. You have a large you know, disciples following you. Now, assume a situation when you somehow get convinced that you should be starting from the center instead of starting from the beginning. So, instead of satisfying the biogenic needs first, you first start from somewhere in the pyramid what happens then? That could be one theoretical possibility. <coughs> Other theoretical possibility could be that instead of climbing up, you start sliding down. Okay, I start from the top and then I gradually come down. Now, think of these uh, theoretical possibilities. The psychological researches prove that if you are you now moving upwards and there is a gradual movement in terms of satisfying needs, the stability component in your life is relatively higher compared to when you think of making quantum jumps. Uh, uh, let us take a parallel type of an example. Say you are in a nursery, you go to class 1 and because you are too good compared to rest of your classmates, okay, you are given a higher grade. But that does not mean that right from class 1 you are told oh, you are so great therefore, you move to class 10 that does not happen. No? So, quantum jumps are usually not allowed in certain type of setups and even in terms of satisfying needs it is always suggested that you move gradually and have a stability. So, if I have moved one step ahead, okay, I am comfortable with this movement, I am also comfortable with the stage where I have attained and there is no risk of sliding back. So, once I have you know, given the passed the exam of class 1 and I move to class 2, I know that there is no point in sliding back, I would not be reverted back to class 1. Okay. So, even in terms of satisfying the needs, the same uh, you know, principle follows that you satisfy your biogenic needs, you satisfy your uh, need for affiliation, security, self esteem and then you move up to self actualization rather than okay, making quantum jumps. It reminds me of a very beautiful story. I do not know if anybody has read this story. Uh, this is basically a story which is you know, full of uh, Buddhist philosophy and a certain type of discourse that takes place in that story. <coughs> if you are interested in stories like that, do read it. It is a fantastic story. It goes like this. There is a small time farmer in a village okay, uh, who happens to be uh, know, facing constant struggle with his life. Okay. So, he does not have good crops uh, coming out uh, of his field, he has certain you know imbalances within the family and he is finally, he is pest. And that was the time when uh, Harshwardhan happened to be the king of India and Buddhist uh, philosophy was being professed everywhere as a way of life. Now, this uh, farmer also heard about it. Okay. <clears throat> so, what he did was he thought that okay, Buddha went to the forest, he sat under a banyan tree. So, he could you know find out certain type of uh, you know uh, key indicators of reaching that state. And to him reaching that state was like say you have to leave your house, you have to go to a forest, you have to sit under a banyan tree, you have to close your eyes, you have to meditate. And 
you also you know become enlightened and therefore, you get rid of all these problems, this is what he thought. So, he left his house, went to a forest, sat under a banyan tree, closed his eyes, but somehow uh, you know because he had walked quite a bit, therefore, he started feeling hungry. So, it was difficult for him to you know remain his eyes closed and concentrate uh, you know mentally while he was meditating, trying to meditate. So, pangs of hunger did not allow him to do this, that was one part of it. Second part of it was that the moment he used to close his eyes, he used to be little scared that there could be you know few animals coming from any side that can uh, be uh, you know uh, dangerous for his life. And these two things did not allow him to meditate. <coughs> his struggle continued for some time and then he decided that there is no point leading a life like this. As a farmer, I have failed. As a person who was trying to replicate the Buddhist way of life, okay, following the way he got enlightenment, okay, he thought that he will also attain and he has failed. So, he decided to commit suicide. He came to the bank of the river, when he found that you know, there was a boat passing by and there were few people uh, on the boat. And the people on the boat thought that this man probably is also willing to go where we are going. So, they said oh you do not you know that uh, know, uh, the king Harshvardhan has asked for a royal debate on the Buddhist philosophy of life. So, we are all going there know. So, come with us and this man thought that okay, I could not meditate, could not uh, get the enlightenment. So, let me go and know, see the discourse. So, he also boarded the boat, went there. Now, starts scene 2 of the uh, story, where uh, the king is there on the dais, the lead priest who is professing the Buddhist philosophy is there on the dais and then there is somebody you know who makes these loud announcements and there, uh, there was a uh, you know, huge crowd sitting down, downwards. And then uh, the king announced that fine uh, you know, we are here to debate the Buddhist way of life. So, this monk will you know one by one talk about the key elements of Buddhist way of life. And if anybody has a contradictory viewpoint, okay, raise your hand and share it, we will have a discourse. If you are able to satisfy the monk's viewpoint, means if you take a upper lead, as it used to happen, no, you will be you know given a reward of these many gold coins. But if you are not able to do that, okay, and in turn you uh, you know the perception would be that you are trying to tarnish the image of the Buddhist way of life, then you would be beheaded. So a great price for you know, not satisfying, but compared to the small price that was being paid for, uh, you know satisfying the monk. <coughs> Now, uh, with all those uh, things celebration, the monk stood and he gave the first sermon that this is what the Buddhist philosophy says, okay, this is what Buddha has suggested and there was complete silence and suddenly this farmer raises his hand okay. and the king thought that no, a farmer like him cannot argue with a monk. No? So, he said are you sure did you raise, really raise your hand and he said uh, yes I have some doubt and thereafter the story takes a beautiful shape you now where you have the hardcore Buddhist philosophy and a contradictory viewpoint from a common man point of view and it is very logical you no? Know? when you read the first logic you say very convincing you read the second logic and you say very convincing and it is very difficult know to uh, finally, come to a conclusion okay, which logic is more effective, more sound, more justified. So, this is how the debate continued. First view point the farmer contradicted and poor farmer said that see I am not a monk, I am just a farmer who had a very tough life and therefore, I am trying to understand this suggesting my experience of life and his experience of life was complete in contrast with what this monk was suggesting. And uh, first point, second point, third point, no? 
and then finally, there was absolute silence on the dais, the monk keeps quiet and the king asks, uh, do not you have a response to his questions. And the monk at the end says that sir, I know there is no uh, nothing wrong with the Buddhist way of life, but I must admit that what he says is also correct okay, and the discourse ends there. It is a beautiful way, but why I was narrating this story to you was, <coughs> if you try to you know make quantum jumps like this farmer did, you know, from an adjustment point of view, you run on the risk of uh, you know, developing one or the other problems, which might require uh, attention of certain stakeholders in the society. It could be uh, you know, detrimental for your society, it could require special attention of uh, caregivers, it could even lead to certain uh, you know, imbalances uh, in your own uh, no, psychological processes. I uh, will take another example, these are all uh, no, uh, historic characters. Uh, I am sure you must be aware of uh, uh, King Bharat, on whose name this country was named Bharat. No? In his dynasty, uh, there were two brothers, uh, Yati and Yayati. Okay? And there is a very interesting story about uh, these two brothers. Uh, one of them was more into worldly affairs and royal way of life. Okay. Uh, he was into this. The other brother, somehow in his early adolescence, he thought that you know, uh, sainthood is the best way of leading life. So, two brothers were completely in contrast with each other in terms of their whole uh, approach towards life. One who was leading a saintly life right from his adolescent years. Second, who was completely into you know all types of uh, deeds and from the modern point of view even misdeeds that usually are associated with royal way of life. <coughs> this continued for uh, years and uh, the boy, uh, the brother who had gone to uh, you know attaining uh, that stage of sainthood okay, did all, all types of uh, things to gain some certain uh, know supernatural power. Okay. He did attain uh, those supernatural powers according to whatever uh, the historic facts or the myths exist in our culture. But at the end of it, uh, this man who was you know, thinking of having uh, know extraordinary extra humanly powers with him comes to one point agenda in his life and that one point agenda was uh, that with the help of the supernatural power that he will acquire, he will convert all women to men and he had his own interpretation why this world should have only men and not women. Okay. Now, think of you know, uh, you know, quantum jumps like this. No? that instead of starting life and moving in uh, you know, step by step method, you just decide at one point of time, biological needs not at all worried, need for affiliation not at all needed, need for security I do not need it. I will begin with self steam and go to self actualization, but at the end all you do is that after attaining that stage to certain extent, okay, you slide back and you start from satisfying certain biogenic and certain uh, sociogenic needs. Okay. And that is the reason why uh, we always focus on maintenance needs when we talk about human adjustment process. What we will do now is that we will take the key maintenance needs and we will discuss them all of them <coughs> at length to try to uh, see you know that how important it is for human beings uh, to have these needs within them. If they do not have it. Okay, it might be detrimental for their own uh, adjustment level. We first come to the first maintenance need, curiosity. Okay, all of us are curious by nature. Okay, uh, think of a small baby. Okay, uh, when uh, babies are not able to uh, discriminate between objects, between 
the presence and the absence of the object. They are also there are very beautiful studies in psychology that talks about curiosity in small babies who cannot converse, okay. uh, but you can make out the difference through the expressions that they have on their faces. There are beautiful research on this, okay. many many uh, research papers, beautiful videos that has come out of those lab experiments. It is like something like say you make a baby sit with the caretaker or the mother because you cannot make the baby sit all alone on the chair. And then you present say a fruit for example, okay, an apple is presented before the baby. Uh, there is you no know, uh, some sense of recognition that you realize on the face of the baby. Okay. And then you hide the fruit and you say certain type of change on the expression of the baby's face to realize that the baby cannot understand know that something that was present has gone missing. Okay, it has been put at the back, but that displeasure of that absence can be decoded on the face of the baby. Okay. Little later, okay, uh, I do not those of you who have uh, you know, interacted with small babies, okay, if you hide something and the moment you move your arm, the babies know perhaps that the object has to do with either of the movement of the arm. No? So, say if there is something and if I remove it, the baby knows that this hand has been used to remove the object. So, the object lies in the hand, if it is not in the hand then you must have dropped somewhere around. Okay. Or if you do like this without holding the object then also the first tendency is to detect the trajectory. No? So, this movement, this direction, this speed somewhere it must have fallen in that direction, small babies can make such predictions. No? These are guided by our basic tendency of curiosity. I am curious about the environment. Okay. <clears throat> Small babies have been found not to be scared of the uh, animals which usually most of us are extremely scared of. Okay. Snakes for example, okay. the other day we took the example that if you are told that uh, we saw a black cobra in this room, okay, but somehow we could not uh, locate it and uh, make it go out of it. So, beware of snakes in the room today. Okay. All of you would keep you know, looking for the snake instead of looking at the projection, okay. because of our basic tendency to be scared of snakes, but leave small babies with snakes in a, a situation and they will try to hold the snake, they will try to touch the snake, they are not at all scared. So, these things are again you no know, guided by the basic sense of curiosity. Why I am giving these examples is that we all right from our uh, you know, uh, basic days as a human baby, we all are driven by certain sense of curiosity and this curiosity uh, further starts getting tamed the once we have our formal education. Okay. You are supposed to be curious in one direction, you are stopped by certain stakeholders not to be curious about the other things. Uh, let us take certain examples, say uh, you go to your school and you are told that see uh, in this period you have to go to a hall which will be packed with books, we call that place library okay. and all of you should read minimum one story and uh, in the next day you uh, when you come to the school you will have to narrate what you had read. I think many of you must have undergone such experiences in your school days. Okay. When you are made to be curious about certain things no? or uh, when uh, you know the good schools nowadays will have uh, all types of display mechanisms, visual displays uh, to drag your curiosity more and more towards the subject. So, that you pay more attention and in that process you learn you know much more comfortably. Whatever you learn remains with you for a relatively longer period of time. Okay. But uh, say think of uh, certain issues which with which uh, our contemporary uh, Indian system is still struggling. Sex education for example, okay. the central board of secondary education I know uh, that it has been uh, you know working on uh, sex education in the schools for last so many, so many years. Okay. 
uh, there were special groups uh, that were formed for this, uh, the group had to identify what type of content, in what form, okay, at what level, for how much duration, everything has been planned. When it came to execution, okay, interesting things happened. School said uh, that uh, compared to the teachers, students have good relationship with their parents. So, the parents should be uh, know the agent who gives this information to the kids. Parents said fine, this is not our business. Okay, I cannot uh, know convey my child these stuff, this is school's responsibility. Okay. Now, in the school who gives uh, know this information? Think of the taboo that is associated with uh, know something that has to do with curiosity. In the schools, two things happened, few schools suggested uh, that uh, we have moral education and the teacher who takes this class engages no moral education class should be talking about this. And they said fine, we talk about moral education as if this is an immoral act. Hence, what to do now? Biology teacher and biology teacher says I have the full syllabus to teach, no, this is not my syllabus. And this continued no, within the school, first with the between the parents and the schools, then uh, within the school who gives this information. And I know uh, most of uh, know the schools did not do that. One school uh, in Maharashtra tried it out, first day, second day and then there was a big demonstration in front of the school, okay, that children are being spoiled, culture is being uh, spoiled and finally, the school had to withdraw it. The school was simply trying to implement what CBSE had suggested. That was to the best of my knowledge, the isolated episode of implementing sex education in India. Since then, everything was put under the carpet, till date schools do not have it. But then, okay, is it that once you move to adolescence, and you move towards your young adulthood years, is it that your curiosity on this subject ceases? The answer is no. You tend to explore more and more okay. and instead of uh, you know, having information which is far more scientific, uh, know, which is full of all types of uh, know, medical recommendations, uh, maybe I uh, come to know from one source which might not be authentic at all, some source which is full of fantasy, third source which could be only and only at anatomy and nothing else. And hence our curiosity makes us move in several other directions. Okay. Think of uh, know, people who were you know, curious about exploring something. And finally, they have they had put their years and years of their life into one small thing to finally realize that yes, atom has you no know, electron, proton, and neutron. Okay. Now, once you have uh, no such type of things, if you read uh, the biographies of these people, okay, you would realize you no know, 14 years of life gone into exploring one thing, but you take extreme pride, you have no you say that all these years were extremely pleasurable for you. Because you are still driven by that sense of curiosity. Okay. We have taken this example of you know, electron, proton, neuton. So, you must be aware of J. J. Thompson's research. No? J. J. Thompson was so involved in his lab activities when he was trying to decipher you know, the ingredients of an atom uh, that uh, you know, most of his time he used to spend in his lab exploring the configuration of the atom. And uh, the day when he had to exchange rings, the wedding ring, okay, he forgot no, that today my marriage is scheduled. I have to go to the church and then exchange the ring. He was still working on whatever he was working on in his life. And then his friend has to give a call to him, come on here, we all are waiting for you, okay, uh, including the bride, where are you? And he said, come on, uh, I am still struggling with something. It is important, let me finish it off, then I will be visiting the church. And then he was bulldozed by his friend that come on, okay, marriage can't wait. No? So, you have to come there. He went there, exchanged the rings and then said that can you drop my wife uh, to my house, I have to go to the lab because I have to complete certain things. That could be you know the extreme of curiosity that you can think of in terms of 
uh, striking balances between uh, different uh, other factors in life. Okay. Uh, you would uh, find you know thousands and thousands of people, of course you would not find such numbers in lakhs and millions, but you will find thousands of people who were extremely guided by this whole sense of curiosity throughout their life. Okay. So, uh, no, I am sure uh, people uh, like uh, uh, the man who uh, explored and invested in all possible formats that uh, nucleic acid. Okay. Uh, he even went to the extent of you know uh, smelling the bandages that are th thrown in the garbages in the hospitals. No? So, it stinks in a very peculiar way, the, hos the hospital garbage has a peculiar smell. So, he used to smell it, he could not decipher, so he even at times he tasted it. No? can on the basis of the test I can decipher what actually it is. Uh, the big success story of a small man uh, from a small southern uh, state in India, uh, who went ahead with uh, these uh, sanitary napkins in our country. You know. If you read his biography, okay, it is full of all types of misunderstandings in his life, because people thought he is actually weird. Okay. And all he wanted was that there can be something that can be done at the local panchayat level, women themselves can produce it, okay, use it and it can be disposed very easily without causing any concern. Okay. Compared to big brands into these, this industry okay, and a handful of Indian women able to afford the price that at which they sell these products. Okay. And then you have all types of uh, taboos associated with the disposal of such things. No? He is a living legend in, in our country right now, listen to him sometime, uh, read about him sometime and you will find you know, how much of struggle he uh, know, even went to the extent of collecting, because he wanted what type of material is best suited, that can be very easily be made available to all Indian uh, houses. And he went to the extent of uh, collecting uh, know, the used sanitary napkins that was thrown here and there. No? He would collect them, spread them on the table, study them, okay, what type of material you know, uh, and all types of product details. Okay. A time came when his mother deserted her son, she thought my son has gone mad. The time when his wife thought this man has gone mad. Okay, he is collecting all uh, know, uh, uh, used sanitary napkins and derives pleasure out of it, some type of deviation. Both of them, you know, mother deserted the son, wife deserted the husband and this man was still passionate about it. You know. So, what is so big you know, about it that at 120 rupees you sell 5 or 7 pieces of these things. Okay. And he was, uh, the guiding force also was you know, that once is of course, the business plan. Okay. And his plan was you know that this technology with the raw material okay, is available by and large in every part of India. So, make the local uh, women in all villages aware of this fact, no? let them produce it themselves. Why should uh, you know, two or three big partners, international partners come into this business and earn money out of it. He was also driven by the fact that India also has a very high number of uh, uh, no, uh, infections, no? UTIs urinary tract infections. You can very easily have a you know, life with minimal uh, urinary tract infection, if you go for certain hygienic practices. Despite the fact that his mother deserted him, despite the fact that his wife deserted him, this man continued and succeeded. Okay. And now you have uh, those you know, very cheap products available in the market. Still he is you know, working on that, working on the business model, where as I told you that the plan is that. Uh, the women in each village can be trained. No, and you have one small place in your uh, know, panchayat bhavan or anywhere, where this uh, small cohort of women from a locality you know, makes it, knows the number, makes it themselves, does everything. So, curiosity can take all types of shapes. No? We have taken the example of Tom, J. J. Thompson, we took this example of uh, this man, we took the example of nucleus, uh, nucleic acid, we took example of children. Okay. Even if you read the whole invention of uh, aeroplane, no? 
right from Mont Golfer to uh, know this um, yes <coughs> and to the modern supersonic jets. Now, when you look at the whole range of things, uh, there was a Buddhist monk in UK uh, who thought that no because birds they dive from a height therefore, they can fly. So, if I also use my two arms and jump from a height I can also fly okay. and that man made a jump and he died. Although he died think of that you know sense of curiosity that would have propelled him to even imagine know that he can wave his arm and can fly like uh, any other bird you are driven by curiosity. Okay. Uh, when the great scientist okay, uh, Newton in his early uh, childhood days he thought why uh, uh, are the birds capable of flying and his imagination was that because they eat insects. Okay, he saw birds eating insects and he thought that probably they eat insects therefore, they can fly and therefore, you know uh, a time came in his life when he made uh, some oral syrup full of insects and fortunately instead of taking himself he gave it to somebody else okay, who was sick had to be taken to the hospital and then this story got deciphered okay, this is what had happened. Okay. So, a curiosity can be uh, in all forms no? the importance of this need is that it somewhere you know uh, always gives you a feel that there are several things that you still need to look at and hence you never get completely satisfied at any point in your life. You reach a level to know that life is beyond this also. You reach a particular level to realize that achievement is beyond this level also. You reach a particular level to realize that recognition is beyond this level also. And your curiosity of exploring life, exploring achievements, exploring different uh, you know, uh, dimensions of uh, different different things in life okay, uh, acts as a propeller for you and hence you never sink in your life. You, know? you go ahead, you float at times okay, and then you again start you know, moving in the other direction. So, life constantly moves for you. Okay. And this is considered to be an important factor in life from adjustment point of view also, because you know that there are several unmet things for which you have to constantly work and therefore, things like uh, you know developing that uh, uh, depressive tendency, uh, de uh, developing a great sense of uh, detachment, that whole feeling of you sinking or all types of uh, you know depressive feelings that uh, makes you think of terminating your life. Those things will never come if you are guided by, if you have that curiosity always propelling you to move in the in the one or the other direction. Okay. Now, the more curious you are much better you will understand things. Okay. The beauty of understanding also is that once you understand things you also realize that there could be the other way of looking at it. No? So, there is nothing like say uh, no, uh, only one perspective, okay. one thing can be looked from different perspective okay. and depending on which perspective you adopt, okay, you will interpret the particular uh, action, the particular phenomena in a different way. Okay. So, your understanding of something might be different compared to my understanding. And because we live in a composite society which comprises of uh, millions and millions of us, okay, uh, therefore, how much is my understanding facilitating my overall uh, know, assimilation in the community, okay. how much I am able to understand the contradictory viewpoints in life, okay. how much am I able to understand the fact that I have understood it one way the other person although it is contradictory has understood in the second way, but there could be a third possibility too and you are open to such things in life. Okay. Basically you act more like a porous object 
who would allow you know, new things to uh, pour in and you would you know, re-examine your own understanding, your own belief, your own uh, you know, thought process. So, curiosity and understanding will that way you know, uh, very easily fit in the process okay. uh, and because you have understood uh, things in a much better way, therefore, you lead life with greater degree of satisfaction. Okay. Uh, couple of years back, uh, somebody from the princely state in uh, uh, Karnataka, whose family, the royal family had accumulated lots of wealth, uh, decided that he would lead life like a monk. And they had you know those uh, precious jewelries, uh, precious stones as part of their heritage. And that man sat on the top of an elephant in the southern one of the southern states, okay, took all that the family had accumulated for those many thousands and thousands of years okay, and just was you know, throwing it on the street and people came you know, grabbing it. Now, think of understanding you know, somebody who understands that these things are immaterial, life is beyond this. Okay, therefore, he is throwing what he already has. The other person who thinks it is important to grab these things. Okay. So, same phenomena and you find two different uh, you know, set of uh, understanding for the life. I am sure um, all of you must have read this story in your English books, perhaps it is in class 10th, 11th or 12th, I do not remember the class now. A beautiful story where uh, two friends had a discussion uh, that can anybody you know, live in isolation for long period of time. And one friend was of the view uh, that if you are put in isolation, it is terrible, nobody can uh, live life like that. The other friend was of the view that uh, no, uh, if you are given uh, good books, they are good friends. Okay. So, in the company of uh, good books, you can certainly live for uh, long in isolation. And they had a bet, uh, the boy who said that it is not possible was you know, extremely rich. And the boy who said that uh, it is possible with books uh, was from a very, very moderate background. So, they had a bet and this I do not remember the number of years, perhaps it was some years no, uh, of confinement in a small room, uh, where only the food will come and new books will be regularly sent to him. And this boy was very sure, damn sure that my friend will certainly you know uh, start hitting the door or the window one day and say please, please, please allow me to go out, I cannot live alone. Okay. Uh, and he was very sure, he was very happy and this boy was very happy being inside the room, because he got chance you know, to read as much as he could. The other friend was you know, continuing supplying him good books. and. After a certain time, when it was coming towards the terminal end of the bet period, the other friend became very anxious, no? because the bet was that if I win, okay, then I will hand over all my wealth to you. So, he was very uh, you know, uh, now anxious that I will have to hand over everything that belongs to me to him, because we will uh, win the bet, because he is coming towards the close end. And a uh, few moments before the actual time was supposed to be over, okay. uh, this boy came running in, because he thought you know, that he will beg pardon and he will say that yes, you have won the bet. And he realized that the door was open, there was nobody inside the room. His friend had left the room with a small cheat, which said that thank you for providing me this opportunity. After you know, reading these many things, I am now much better, uh, I have much better understanding of life and I understand that wealth is nothing. Hence, keep your wealth with you, I will keep my knowledge with myself, thanks. And he left the room. That is you know, another way of looking at understanding. You know. So, all I am trying to say is that, different types of needs, they all influence our understanding, our way, the way we would interact with the situations in our life, which in turn will decide whether we are able to strike the balance in our life or we you know tend to become more and more deviant okay. and how much 
we comply to the expected social norm, how much we are able to satisfy our own personal desires and how much opportunity we give to ourselves and to others to grow in this process collectively. Okay. So, that is about understanding. Then the third factor comes, uh, where you will like uh, know things to be in order. Okay. And the reason why you want to want things to be in order is because it increases the possibility of making predictions. Okay. Being orderly in life is fantastic. You have a particular time when you go to the bed, you have a particular time when you wake up, you have a breakfast time, you, you have a study time. So, for most of the major businesses in life, you have fixed timings, your life is orderly. Even doctors would recommend know that do not have uh, know, variation in your sleep timing. If you have a random sleep timings, then it is going to put you in trouble in a very big way. So, try to have a regulated uh, know, sleep. Similarly, have uh, know, uh, know, regulated eating practices also. Do not go for random food. Know. Once you have a breakfast at 5 o'clock in the morning, next day at 10 o'clock, third day no breakfast at all. Do not have this type of a random variations. Okay. Other things in terms of being orderly is that how much you are uh, know, adhering to the social norm, so that you in the society and society at large remains in that orderly fashion, there is no major hiccup. Okay. So, maintaining uh, order at the personal level, allowing order to be maintained at the social level and when you are in small groups. Okay, you try to maintain that order. That very need, which makes you appreciate order, that makes you uh, know fall in order, okay, also helps you adjust in a much better way. And the more orderly you are, the more curious you were, the more you have understood, all these three things will know further now make you predict certain things, because you have experienced things, you have understood things. You were curious, you explored more, because you explored more, you understood well, because you understood well and you have put things in order, you, know, you can realize that now there is a component of predictability. For example, if I have been uh, know, curious about the course content, if I have been curious about reading the details, if I have understood the subject matter clearly, if you have uh, know, know, put arranged all these uh, information and knowledge put together in order then be it quiz, be it uh, mid sem exam, be it end sem exam, you can predict your score. I will certainly be above this. Okay. I will certainly be you know, gaining much better than those who have not studied well. That helps you predict. On the other hand, uh, you can find the predictability in uh, another interesting format, where you ask somebody, you show your palm and somebody who says know that I am a palmist and I can read the lines and tells you, you know this is what it is and this is what it is not and you should do this, you should do that. There are people know who do does this and the business thrives, those who are into such businesses, they thrive like anything. You must have seen on the pavements, you know, uh, parrots in small cages with few cards. And you do not rely your own intelligence, you rely the intelligence of a parrot who would randomly go and pick a card. Okay. And this man who will charge you 1 rupee, 2 rupee or 5 rupees will tell you this is what your card says. It does not say that there was a parrot who did not apply the brain, simply mechanically went and brought a card. Similarly, those who give you gems, no? have this in this finger, have this in this finger, have that on Monday, have this on Tuesday, this on Thursday. Okay. All you do you do all of this, because you want your life to follow an order, so that there is a component of predictability. And more and more you are able to predict, the more and more is the consonance level. No? Because if you have a higher degree of unpredictability in life, okay, that creates great degree of dissonance within you. And human beings are not so capable of handling dissonance. Okay. That you know, that is the point where you develop one or the other aberrations in the behavior, you pay the price for being associated with dissonance for a longer period. And hence, people would always like to have predictability in their life, because 
this will help them minimize dissonance. If you minimize dissonance in life, life is very orderly and you are able to uh, strike balance in life in most of the situations and hence your adjustment will never, never be at stake.